So first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Carol, uh, Jill, for the invitation and the society. Uh, for someone who works on uh, germ cells and epigenetics, it's uh, certainly a wonderful meeting to uh, come to. I'm not a regular attendee. Um, and it's uh, very special to be here for the anniversary. So I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, my task is to uh, talk about germ cells, epigenetics, and some possibilities for heritability from some of the studies that uh, we have uh, been, been doing. So my laboratory's interest has been interested in epigenetics for a number of years, and uh, in particular in regards to preventing birth defects in children. Um, and most of the work that we've done has been on the effects of various uh, genes, uh, diet exposures on the epigenome and the impact of that on uh, the embryos and the uh, offspring later in life. And most of the work we have done has been on the developing eggs, sperm, and the early embryos. And this is because very dramatic programming, the most dramatic programming during life of ep the epigenome takes place as the eggs and sperm are developing, starting in utero, and uh, also during the first uh, six days uh, of life. And so I'll show you a little bit of that programming. So it's a time that is particularly susceptible, we think, to environmental uh, exposures. And the one that I'm going to talk about today is uh, maybe unlikely, but it's folic acid. Okay, so you heard a very nice uh, background and history going back a long way uh, from uh, Chris this morning on the uh, epigenome. Here I've uh, depicted in one uh, diagram the, the different marks that um, can lead to heritable uh, expression, uh, DNA methylation, histone uh, marks, RNA-based uh, mechanisms. And uh, the important aspect of this is the heritability of these uh, marks so that the, if there is a perturbation of a normal epigenomic mark, it can be uh, passed through a number of uh, cell divisions and be in inherited. And so uh, most of our studies have been on DNA methylation and the talk I'll give today will be only on uh, DNA methylation. But you must remember that all of these marks work uh, together and in fact an environmental exposure could for instance uh, affect histone modifications that could then lead to an alteration in DNA methylation and a lot of the enzymes uh, work uh, uh, together or um, against one another. So. Um, even looking at something like DNA methylation, we have a lot of uh, challenges. And so the, here I show uh, DNA methylation that occurs on the five position of cytosine uh, residues. About 80% of the uh, CPG dinucleotides in our DNA are methylated, and it's about 20 to 30 million, depending on whether you're a mouse or a human. So that's a lot of sites to be thinking about uh, when we're doing studies to see how an environment has impacted the DNA methylome. Um, a lot of the um, methylation is in retrotransposons that have come into our genomes over an uh, evolutionary time, but also there's methylation within satellite sequences, uh, single copy genes, imprinted genes are uh, particularly important because there is uh, parental allele specific methylation and that if you lose the methylation from one of your parents, you can't make it up uh, after uh, fertilization. So imprinted genes are very important for uh, development and if the imprints go wrong, there are dramatic consequences. Um, one of the important aspects of uh, DNA methylation and the, epi the other epigenomic marks is that they are reprogrammed almost completely at two different times of development, in primordial germ cells and uh, in the early embryo, in that first uh, uh, six days of life. So theoretically, this prevents the accumulation of epimutations across uh, generations, but we're now learning that uh, some can, can escape. I'll get this figured out. Um, so 
Today, I'm going to concentrate on folic acid. So why folic acid? Folic acid was uh, introduced into the food supply in the 1990s in North America and in other countries um, to prevent uh, neural tube defects. And it was very effective in uh, doing that. The neural tube defect rates uh, went down. And so uh, if you look now at how much folic acid you get from your diet, it's about 200 micrograms per day. And then during pregnancy, pregnant women will be uh, given uh, extra folic acid at the, about 400 micrograms a day and the upper limit is considered to be one milligram per day. However, with time, much higher doses have started to be used in a number of settings, um, including uh, for men with infertility. Uh, they've been using uh, doses of five milligrams a day, so that's 10 times the uh, dose uh, recommended for pregnancy. And uh, higher doses are also used in um, when you suspect that there is a high risk of neural tube defects in the pregnancy, but also for other high-risk pregnancies. So, so for instance, for many uh, women who use assisted reproduction, they will be prescribed these high doses of uh, fol folic acid. Um, so the uh, questions have come up. Uh, could the higher doses of folic acid um, be good or uh, not so good? And uh, people have started to, to look at that. Okay, so why folic acid? So uh, folate um, provides us with um, methyl groups for s methionine, which is a universal me methyl donor and is important for the methylation of uh, cytosines in, in DNA. This shows you the metabolic pathway for uh, folate coming in uh, through the, the diet into the folate metabolic uh, pathway. Um, you'll see here an, an enzyme, methylene tetrahydrofolate uh, reductase, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in relation to the sperm studies. And uh, the uh, methyl groups then get shuttled over to the other side of the, the pathway shown here, where they uh, then provide uh, methyl groups for many different uh, reactions, including uh, DNA methylation. So the questions that uh, I want to uh, address today are uh, what is the impact of the high dose folic acid supplements that are being used on uh, human sperm and um, how can we use mouse models to try and help us understand what we're seeing in the human studies and can some of the exposures we're seeing and some of the effects that we're seeing be transmitted to the uh, next generation? So we, I'm going to show you very quickly some of the human studies that we've done, but then in more detail the uh, mouse studies to uh, get at uh, the mechanisms. So most, most of the talk will be on uh, spermatogenesis, but at the end I'll talk about some effects on, on oocytes. Okay, so ju just to remind you of the really critical uh, phases of spermatogenesis, we have the primordial germ cells which uh, divide in, uh, in utero in the developing uh, testis before birth, and in fact this is a pretty important time for the acquisition of methylation patterns after they're erased in the primordial germ cells. Uh, following uh, birth uh, puberty, um, but before that, you have the um, division of the spermatogonial uh, stem cells, and they maintain the patterns that were set down uh, before birth, and they also lay down uh, some uh, new patterns. And uh, methylation then is remodeled uh, slightly as it goes through uh, spermatogenesis. But there are also some, some, very, uh, some, some other very important aspects of spermatogenesis, including the uh, very big changes in chromatin that take, take place. And we know now of uh, histone methylation that is very important in sperm and that gets uh, inherited in the, uh, the embryo. Okay, so the two key periods of uh, DNA methylation uh, acquisition are shown here. So initially you'll have erasure in the primordial germ cells, so that's across all, almost all of the 20 to 30 million sites. And then you acquire methylation in the uh, prenatal gonad in, in males. 
um, and it's maintained postnatally in the spermatogonia as they uh, start into a meiosis. Okay, so another way of looking at this and then adding in the female germ cell uh, picture. Here we have development going all the way from uh, before birth, the primordial germ cells, the erasure of methylation, both in the male and in the female, uh, whether you have, depending on whether you have a testis or a, an ovary. You have reacquisition in the male before birth, but this reacquisition in the female only occurs after birth as the oocytes grow and before uh, ovulation. At the uh, time of fertilization then, you have both oocyte and sperm specific patterns so that for something like imprinted genes, you'll have maternal uh, imprints and paternal uh, imprints. And then um, at this time, in the first six days of life, you have a second reprogramming period where almost all of the methylation again is erased except for imprinted genes which must maintain their gamete derived patterns and then there is re-establishment of methylation in the embryo and in the placenta to different uh, degrees uh, around the time of implantation. So there are however the uh, question that we asked first from our human studies was that if you're giving these men high doses of folic acid could that folic acid affect the uh, sperm epigenome? So the men that we were looking at were uh, idiopathic infertile men. They're the ones who are often given uh, these high doses of folic acid. And what we did was to give them folic acid daily for a period of six months. So this was two rounds of spermatogenesis. We collected sperm before they started their treatment and at the end uh, of the treatment. The same time uh, we did all of the other assays looking at, uh, at hormones, uh, B12, um, we looked at folate to make sure that they had been taking their folic acid. And uh, the most important part of what I'm going to show you here is that we compared the sperm epigenomes. So uh, we looked at DNA methylation using reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. So this is a next generation sequencing based assay that allows you to look at about 3 million methylation of 3 million uh, CPGs in uh, the epigenome. Uh, and on top of this, we added uh, a look at the MTHFR genotype. So methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase is very important for the use of uh, folate in the folate pathway, and there's a very important polymorphism that affects the uh, level of activity of this, this enzyme, and it can uh, affect disease also. Okay, so um, this is the enzyme MTHFR. There is a very common polymorphism of this, this enzyme that uh, changes a conserved uh, alanine to valine. And the men with a TT genotype have 50% uh, reduced activity of the enzyme. And so this is found at about 10% uh, in uh, the population. So it's quite, quite frequent, higher in other populations. And it appears to be overrepresented in male infertility. So in this study that we did, we had 30, 30 men. And of those 30 men, they were about equally divided between those that, that had the CC genotype the CT heterozygote genotype and the TT genotype associated with the uh, decrease in enzyme activity. So uh, I'm just going to show you a summary of the DNA methylation uh, data, and uh, that's shown here. And it's divided up between the, uh, first of all, here, all of the individuals, and then the three different uh, genotypes. And what you see on the uh, y-axis is the number of differentially methylated tiles. These were at least two CPGs had to be affected uh, for a tile to be called. Um, and we had to have at least 10%. So these are significant uh, 10 to 20% changes in methylation. And what you see here is that there are thousands of tiles that are affected um, as a result of the folic acid looking uh, change. 
comparing the before at the, and the after uh, treatment. So um, what was somewhat surprising, however, we had expected that folic acid might increase methylation in DNA. In fact, we found both increases and decreases. The increases are the uh, black and the decreases are the uh, gray. But surprisingly, we found more hypomethylation than hypermethylation. And if we looked at our genotype, the TT genotype, this was uh, exacerbated so that the, the sperm epigenome was hypomethylated. There was less methylation, and this was uh, un unexpected. So then we could look at the various uh, genic regions that were affected and the types of pathways uh, that uh, came, came up are shown, shown here. So you'll see uh, neurobehavioral, but a lot of uh, the sites were associated with uh, cancers. So um, this concerned us that there may be an effect on the sperm epigenome that uh, could be then uh, passed on to, to the next generation. So how do you test that? It's uh, probably very difficult to do unless you get much larger uh, populations and do the appropriate human studies. And I've been trying to uh, convince my clinical, uh, clinical colleagues and epidemiological colleagues that uh, we should be looking at sperm much more often in some of the large uh, studies that are being done. But what we can do is we can go back to a mouse study to try and figure out whether what, what is the, uh, the basis of the findings we have here, and is there biological plausibility um, and similarities of effects. Okay, so what, what we did was to go back to uh, an inbred uh, mouse model, and uh, with our colleague Rima Rosen, we have a model that represents the MTHFR uh, TT genotype men, and we could use uh, folic acid of uh, Ten, tenfold levels similar to what was used in the human study, and then even higher uh, levels. And these mice were treated for quite a bit longer than in our human study. They're treated for six to uh, 12 uh, months. And what we were asking was, if we then go and look at the sperm of these animals, do we see a similar effect as we had seen in, in the human uh, study? And again, we're using reduced representation by sulfide sequencing so that we can get a genome-wide look um, across uh, the whole DNA methylome. And the results are shown here, even more dramatic than what we had seen in the human studies. So this is just showing you the number of uh, tiles that were affected, but the light color showing you that um, the most effect was on hypomethylation. So they, were, they had very hypomethylated genomes as a result of the uh, folic acid. In this case, it's the um, MTHFR++ uh, genotype. Um, with 20-fold dose, and this is the um, plus-minus equivalent to the TT genotype men uh, with the 10-fold uh, diet. Okay, so um, why might high doses of folic acid uh, result in uh, more hypomethylation of DNA? So we go back to uh, this, this pathway. What we know is if you use very high doses of fo folic acid, you can overwhelm the intestinal um, breakdown system. You build up the amount of dihydrofolate, and this is a potent inhibitor of MTHFR. So that like uh, having l too little folic acid, you don't get enough methyl groups over here. Um, the same thing can happen with too high doses of folic acid. You inhibit the MTHFR enzyme, and this does not allow the methyl groups to get to the other side of the, of the pathway. So um, how can we prove that this is happening in our system? We couldn't in the men because most men will not let you go in and do a testicular biopsy. It certainly <laughs> wouldn't get through the ethics committee, and it would not be um, uh, clinically uh, allowed. However, you can do this in the mouse. And so what we can ask in the mouse is, do those doses of folic acid affect uh, MTHFR in the testis? And so this is what you can uh, see here, is that uh, there is a down-regulation of MTHFR, potentially explaining why we have hypomethylation of, of DNA. And what, when we went back to compare the human and the mouse data, we found that there were a lot of common pathways that emerged 
from the mouse and human DNA methylation data. And interestingly, some of those uh, sites that are known to um, escape methylation in the uh, prenatal window and in uh, early development were ones that were affected in uh, these, these studies, uh, suggesting that they might be passed on to uh, the next generation. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of interest in knowing whether or not uh, epigenetic uh, patterns can be altered and the uh, effects tra transmitted to the next generation. Again, it's easier to do this in an, an animal study. So what we did was to use these same types of doses we used in uh, the postnatal study here and go back and look in um, a mouse model over a number of generations at both low and at high dose of folic acid and ask whether or not there were adverse effects uh, across generations. So uh, this, is, this is the model. These are studies that were published a couple of years ago. And basically what we did was to uh, do lifetime exposure of males. So these are men that were started on their diets. Uh, so these were uh, mice that were started on their diets before birth as uh, fetuses. Um, at the time when you erase and then reset uh, methylation. And they were maintained on the treatment until they grew, grew up, at which point they were mated and they produced the F2 and then the F3 generation, but the, the were diets were not uh, continued. So the, the diet was all the way from uh, all of sperm development from the prenatal to the postnatal windows. And what we did was to uh, look at uh, folic acid control diet. We used seven-fold deficiency. Um, again, we wanted to see what would happen with too little folic acid. Previous studies from Sarah Kimmon's lab had suggested that uh, there were growth defects and birth defects in the next generation as a result of that uh, dose of folic acid deficiency. We used the 10-fold supplemented and the 20-fold uh, uh, su supplemented. So here you can see the uh, F1 litter sizes. So these are the uh, offspring of the exposed uh, males, of exposed germ cells. And uh, for the most part, the litter sizes were normal. The F1 body weights uh, were normal. However, the sperm counts of these men were lower in both the deficient and in the highest dose uh, of folic acid uh, group. And so then the, the next question was, um, it, it looked like something had happened to the germ cells during that exposure time. Did that result in abnormalities in the next generation if these males who were not on the diets um, were uh, mated? And so what we see in the F2 is that there was an effect on litter size at weaning in the highest uh, dose group and there was uh, evidence of postnatal pre-weaning pre mortality in, again, the low dose and in the highest dose group here. So evidence that those germ cells had uh, affected the, the next uh, generation. So then we, we wanted to know, okay, you're treating with uh, these different folic acid diets. Does it affect the sperm epigenome in order to result in these types of effects that you're seeing here? And so what you see here is an imp one of the imprinted genes that we, we looked at. Uh, we looked at a number of different CPGs across the imprinted, imprinted genes in each of uh, the diet groups. There's very tight uh, results for the control, but there is a spread of the results in almost all of the treatment groups, and you can see the vari variance here. So that suggested to us that, that there was an effect on the sperm of, of the males. And we went on to do uh, reduced representation by sulfite sequencing and found defects in all of our groups shown here, and what I'm showing is the F1 sperm and the F2 sperm. The F1 sperm are in uh, the white, the second generation in uh, black, and what you can see is that there are, there's differential methylation across uh, both generations, and it appears that there's exasper exacerbation with the uh, highest dose into the uh, F2 uh, sperm.
Okay, so um, basically what we think is happening is that too little folic acid is leading to decreases in uh, methyl, methyl groups and too much folic acid is leading to decreases in MTHFR activity at the same time decreasing uh, the methyl groups. So it looks like I am getting towards the end of my time. Um, and so this is just a summary of the, the male results. What we think is happening is that treatments that we have given uh, are through the lifetime of the male germline all the way from prenatal development through to uh, sperm. At that time, you have not only establishment of erasure and establishment of DNA methylation, but there are also histone marks and uh, small non-coding RNAs. The uh, diets may be affecting uh, both uh, the histone methylation and uh, DNA methylation. But what we see in the sperm is decreases in sperm counts and altered epigenome. What we think is uh, that we may have uh, germ, germ cell heterogeneity and pot potentially epigenetic instability, and this results in uh, defects in the F2 offspring. So um, we've also done an experiment on the female germline, and I'm not going to have time to show you that, but I will uh, sum summarize it. Okay, so um, what we had, what we wanted to know uh, was in the in the male germline, our exposure had been all the way through uh, spermatogenesis. And uh, so our female exposure, we did just in this period here, prenatally, and not in the postnatal acquisition period. And our hypothesis was that there would not be an effect. Um, and uh, what we got was an effect. So what we, we think is that uh, in the female germline, these doses of uh, folic acid may be altering histone uh, modifications, uh, which then lead to uh, methylation abnormalities in uh, the female germ cells. So I'm going to go through that um, quickly. And just summarize, we've used clinically relevant high-dose folic acid and have found altered DNA methylation in human sperm. We think this is, is relevant because these high doses are used in uh, human infertility uh, treatment and we're in fact more concerned about its use in, in high risk pregnancies because the prenatal uh, germ cells would be affected during that uh, time. Clearly there was evidence of gene environment interactions and this is something that we need to think about for human uh, studies and we've shown that we can use animal models to try and understand uh, the, the uh, me mechanisms. And so uh, again, the, the dose is the poison and uh, I think you know, this, this is an example of too much of a good thing and uh, certainly the NIH has paid attention and had a workshop uh, uh, a month ago to try and uh, look at this problem more. Uh, more clearly. And I'd just like to uh, thank all of the people in my lab, Lundy Lee and uh, Donovan Chan, shown here, were the key people uh, doing these studies, and Mahmoud uh, Rabi, and I have lots of support uh, from our genomics colleagues, our uh, colleagues at uh, McGill and at Health Canada, Amanda McFarland, help, helping us with the uh, folic acid uh, studies. Thank you.